Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you to the Overseas Education Outlook 2022. And this is part two of the series. Uh, for those who are continuing to watch this for continues to track us for some time, you would have realized that this we did the first part uh, some time back. That was exactly about a month ago on the 11th of February. And the recordings are available on um, the YouTube too or our, on our channel in case you want to subscribe to that channel or follow us. Please do that and hear us and hear the experts about what they have to say about specific countries, about how, what, is, what do they feel Outlook 2022 and 23 is going to be. So let me just, you know, commence today's session by giving you um, an idea about what is this event all about. Um, you see a three word, of, um, three word, uh, you know, a phrase here, um, which way forward, Outlook for 2022, 2022, which way forward. What does it mean? Well, uh, you know, we are into, the, into this business for quite some time today, and I'm sure you do have a, quite a bit of experience on overseas education, stud sending students outside of India to the developed or other world. And uh, of course, the purpose is to study and then probably, you know, whatever they want to do in that part of the world. But um, all going well, 2020, March of 2020, distorted or disturbed these graphs Phenomenally, you all know that. And the reason was COVID. Uh, well, we all hear today that things are going to be fine or have turned fine in some places, uh, but they have been fluctuating too, as per what the newspapers and the news say. Well, uh, we, are, we all have been used to listening to all this only by the hearsay, only what the newspapers mention, only what the news channels mention. But we really don't know what's going on on ground zero. So this uh, forum exactly is, you know, um, the purpose of this forum is to find out what's happening on ground zero exactly and what should be our business game plan for near and far term, which I say that, for, for example, fall of 2022 and, for, and the next year, how should we play our cards? So that's the, this, the, that's the idea of this summit. That's a genesis, that's a, that is a genesis and purpose of this summit. Um, I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago that this is part two, but what happened in part one? Well, we had four experts uh, you know, participating in, in uh, our summit. The gentleman came from France, Canada, the lady from Germany, and also from US. So if you want to really uh, hear them out as to what they said about these four countries specifically, please, do mention, uh, you know, on the chat box or otherwise, we will be glad to share you the videos or the links where these are uploaded. And you, I'm sure you'll be able to better plan your uh, game plan, uh, your business plan for the current year. As I said some time back, the first part was on 11th of February, today is 15th of March, and we are going to have the second part played today with another zero for, for a few countries. What are a few countries today? see that now. Uh, I'm going to show you, I'm going to present to you uh, a lady from Ireland, Ms. Celestine Dowland. She's the president of Galway Business School. Spain, Mr. Gonzalo. Singapore, uh, she, uh, she's Ms. Rani and the country manager for India and Sri Lanka from, uh, from an organization called MDIS. And Dr. Singh, who is an international country and education expert from Australia. Moving ahead. The key takeaway is what should you expect for, from out of uh, this session when we finish out here? Uh, well, as I said some time back, we don't know what is the situation out there really. So let's understand from the experts who live there to find out what happens, uh, what's happening really, and how the government systems are taking care, how the universities are taking care of this, and what they feel the things or situation is going to be in the near future. So along with the uncertainties that exist today, what is a suggested business game plan for the fall of 2022? And some thoughts that will determine serious decisions, expectations, including a business continuity and growth for all of us. So let me, without wasting much time, I'm going to call upon the first uh, person on board today. Uh, I just mentioned her name a few minutes ago. She is Ms. Celestine Rowland. She's the president of Galway Business School. She's going to tell something about uh, Ireland as a territory. 
how this looks like and how it was it shaped during the you know the difficult time of covid just a very quick and brief introduction about her she believes in the iu with uh, iu's vision that everybody can access education to grow and that we can achieve this together in a strong world she served for about 10 years plus in various positions in education media and telecommunications and she's worked in the position of ceo as uh, director group strategy and operation and as management consultant in some of her last assignments today she is president of polwell business school ireland um, with having said that i'm going to call upon her to please come online and uh, share her vision with you all right uh, guys uh, audience i'm talking to you uh, i have already introduced you with uh, ms uh, celestine rowland she is going to tell us something about ireland and how opportunities exist and how country as an ireland uh, has taken care of the covid situation overall she is of course going to also you know very briefly tell about, tell us about uh, her own college that she belongs to over to you celestine thank you very much mr kumar and thank you for the opportunity to speak today at the overseas education summit and the outlook for 2022 ireland education and international education in ireland is a very important activity for our economy and for our future development of our economy ireland and education in ireland prides itself on world class standards and giving international students the warmest of welcomes it is a major and growing study abroad destination for international students as it offers significant opportunities for academic achievement and success as well as the opportunity to start and build a successful career in many sectors throughout the economy excuse uh, me let, yes you can... i let me let me switch off my video so you can continue speaking celestine okay i'll okay. be there otherwise ireland is known as the emerald eye and post brexit it is the only majority english speaking country in the european union we are very proud members of the european union the emerald eye we are known as because we are very green landscape and we have a very environmentally friendly economy we are also the stepping stone between the eu and the us between boston and berlin and this is a very important factor why so many global corporations have chosen ireland as their european and world hub it is a beautiful peaceful country and one of the safest countries in the world and often ranked as one of the friendliest and most welcoming countries which is very important when students decide to choose where to study we also have a big tourism industry but our growing community of international students are very important for us over 40000 international higher education students choose ireland each year so ireland offers 5000 internationally recognized qualifications at undergraduate and postgraduate level all of ireland's universities are ranked in the top 5% globally and now there are some changes as ireland has created and created new technological universities which were formerly known as institutes of technology there is also a significant number of private specialist institutions and all institutions are renowned for close links with industry and enterprise this is a key feature of education in ireland making courses very practical for graduates and so graduates in ireland attain very high employability rates If you look at Ireland as a destination students can avail of 24 month stay back option 
And this can be done in two parts. Students who complete a level eight and honors undergraduate program at bachelor's level can stay back for 12 months. And then when they complete a master's program, they can stay back for a further 12 months, or they can have two years in total after a master's program. Ireland is a great launch pad for careers for international graduates because there are lots of vacancies throughout the economy. Ireland is known as the Silicon Valley of Europe. And the reason why is it is home to so many international companies, American, European, world-class companies. As you can see, they all have headquarters, either European or world headquarters in Dublin, in Galway, and right throughout the country. So each single city or town actually attracts these international companies. And the reason that these companies are attracted to Ireland are multifaceted. They are attracted because number one, we speak English. Number two, the level of graduates in the country are of a very, very high standard. So we satisfy their employment needs. Number three, we are part of the European Union and it is easy for uh, companies who locate in Ireland to trade right throughout Europe. In spite of Brexit, we still have significant economic links with the UK and these will continue. And there are huge advantages for companies located in Ireland to trade very successfully with the UK because we have highly preferential trade agreements with it. Also, many of our institutions, including all of the universities, all of the new technology universities and the private sector are producing graduates that are needed in this arena. As well as that, of course, we have a very preferential tax regime for these companies. But this, in actual fact, is the least attractive, um, what would I say, it's the most known attraction, but in fact, the other attractions of locating in Ireland are much more important. If you look at Irish education and why students would choose us, we offer a full study pathway from foundation, undergraduate, masters and doctorate programmes throughout Ireland. And if students from uh, any of the markets represented today wish to see whether students would qualify, there's a very useful website called naric.ie where all qualifications from any part of the world can find their equivalents for entry into the Irish education system. The record of results and student progression is excellent. And because our qualifications are internationally recognized and linked to European qualifications, it means that students who graduate from Irish universities can travel anywhere in the world and their qualifications will stand to them for their careers. We are also very technology driven, very technology driven in our communities and in enterprise. And if you like, COVID has actually accelerated this technology adaptation process. If you look at it from uh, students, there are at least 160 countries from where international students come to study in Ireland and they feel at home. Obviously, COVID has changed the international recruitment landscape for many students. If you look at the student, sorry, excuse me, the student recruitment outlook for 2022, in general, institutions feel that international student recruitment is very strong. Students have spent two years without being able to travel and they have studied online. The demand now for across all sectors in higher education courses is that students want face-to-face -face classes or a combination of hybrid and face-to-face. -face. 
the number of applications into universities and third level colleges in Ireland from the Indian subcontinent post COVID is particularly strong. And there are growing numbers of undergraduate students from different markets in the area. The number of employment, the advantage of choosing Ireland for international students is that they can work and study while in Ireland. And most students will find a job during either their undergraduate studies or during their postgraduate studies. This gives them a huge, huge advantage when they want to join the actual um, job market as a career move. And the number of people employed in Ireland has reached 2 million people. It seems very small in Indian or the Indian subcontinent terms, but this is the biggest number of people employed in Ireland ever in the history of the state. There are vacancies across all sectors of the economy, which is really good for students who wish to have a part-time job in hospitality, but also really good for students who want to make Ireland their career choices. Work practices have changed somewhat and will probably not revert to pre-COVID era because technology has been leveraged hugely during COVID and this has helped people to work from home and there is now a huge demand for remote working throughout the economy of Ireland. So people can, be, can live and work in Ireland, obviously, but they could also live elsewhere while still working in Ireland remotely. The difficult to fill vacancies each year, the Skills and Labour Markers Research Unit publishes reports about vacancies throughout each sector. Obviously, science, engineer and technology have 46% of the vacancies, but for graduates who do not have a specialty, business and other graduates account for 11%. And many of these roles are in the tech sector, jobs and sales, business development, etc. Highly paid, highly desirable jobs. If you look at why the difficult to fit, fill vacancies are, is because candidates with specific industry experience, candidates who have followed a course that is linked to industry are in shorter supply. And if you look at it, 64% of vacancies in 2021 were regarded as being very difficult to fill. So this creates huge opportunities for international students. And one of the reasons that there are so many vacancies is that international candidates and international students returned home during COVID and have yet not come back in the same numbers. But we see that this will change in the fall of 2022. 33% of the difficult to fill vacancies were for Irish candidates only. The rest, almost 60%, were for a combination of EU and non-EU candidates. And you can see a very useful website there for um, your audience, which gives the National Agency on Employment. Also, experience was a huge issue. So students who have worked during their course of studies in a part-time job actually achieve employability in Ireland much quicker than those who do not work. Why is this? This is because these students now understand Irish cultural work ethic, if you like, because each country has different expectations of their employee, and it is important to be in touch with the culture of Ireland, which people can develop this students can develop this skill while they're working in a part-time job, getting them ready for their career choice. The contract type can differ generally, 52% are permanent positions. So there are huge numbers of jobs available for international students in the Irish economy. And this is set to grow in spite of a post COVID era, Demand is rising all the time. So if you look, demand is rising for employees. The supply of skilled staff has fallen. These are the key responses to this 
survey on difficult to fill vacancies. Experienced and skilled staff is difficult to source. So this is an important consideration for international students when they are choosing their course of study, because they should look carefully at the links that their choice of course has to enterprise and industry and what modules or what assessments and assignments they can follow that will make them more attractive as a new employee. COVID has hindered the flow of international candidates. In some cases, students still need upskilling and training. So they should really look at courses that give them more of what we call transferable skills, communication skills, cultural awareness skills, skills to do with um, data collection, research, all of these skills are in high demand. And the new industry is sustainability. So almost every new role or work or job is looking at the future of the planet and the impact of climate change on each single business. So students should be looking at sustainability as part of their course of study. Students' concerns. With travel restrictions in place during COVID, many students continued their courses online, but the Irish government was very uh, wise in they allowed students still to keep their stay back option. So they may well have studied their master's programs or their undergraduate honours programs at home in their home country, but they could still travel to Ireland after COVID when the borders opened up to use the stay back option and develop their career in Ireland. Also one of the, um, what would I say, uh, results of COVID is that institutions have developed very favorable refund policies for students who might change their mind on the basis or canceled their program due to this post COVID era, because we're still in a post COVID era. Many institutions now have some form of hybrid education and have leveraged technology hugely to help students. This does not mean that students will not have face-to-face -face classes. What it means is there are additional supports in most cases for students because classes are recorded, there are additional elements of support online and students have the opportunity to follow or um, make up classes they may, may have missed or revise information that they need to do before they set their um, exams or their assignments. During COVID, and this will continue, all international students, everybody in the country had free access to medical care during COVID or as a result of COVID, um, what would I say, uh, contacting COVID or whatever. If you look at our own institution, Galway Business School, we offer undergraduate programs at bachelor's level. So we have a Bachelor of Business Level 7, which is a three-year programme, but the Bachelor of Business with International Business Level 8 is the programme that allows students the stay-back option. And we have a number of inbuilt shorter programmes in certificate mode. We also offer pathway programmes, foundation and pre-masters programmes. The majority of our students are a mix of Irish and international students. And the reason our graduates are successful when they go to the local university after completing the level eight degree with us, they end up usually as number one, number two, number three, or number four master's graduates. Why is that? Our students, do not qualify to get into the top institutions, the Ivy League colleges in the US. Galway Business School students are students in many cases who do not, who choose Galway Business School because they do not want a large institution. They choose it because they require additional levels of support and they choose it because class size is small. 
Small class sizes is a feature of many programs. What is unique to Galway Business School is that our students have access, much greater access to lectures than in any other comparable program. And for that reason, and the support they get through, throughout their course of study, they do remarkably well. And our job is to ensure that they achieve their maximum potential. There is no escape if class size is less than 50 students in a class, and that is our um, student cohort in general. Also, our student experience allows students to have many in-company visits throughout their course of study with us. We have entrepreneurial workshops where we have experts who come in and give students talks on how to become an entrepreneur if they want to start up, even to do mini companies while they're studying. And we have a study abroad experience in the final year where we go to a country in Europe. Obviously, this study abroad experience did not happen in during COVID, but we did it quite cleverly online. Our plan for 2022 intake is to go to uh, Rome because we have a memorandum of understanding with a college in Rome and we are going to visit some wonderful companies there and then students have to do an assignment based on this study abroad experience. Galway itself is the second destination for startup companies outside of Dublin. It has three or four major, major startup uh, initiatives, including Galway Technology Centre, the Porter Shed, the iHub, and the hub in the university. And all of these talks and workshops make for successful entrepreneurs. And most people either want to work in a successful career or want to start their own um, what would I say, their own uh, company. We also do a lot of employability workshops right from the year one, right through year four. So this gives students added advantage in making sure that they understand the demands of working in Ireland. They understand the requirements um, that prospective employees are looking for and that they are tutored and understand what they can bring to any number of companies, either technology companies, either local companies, or if they want to start up their own company. So we prepare them for job opportunities of the future. We do CV preparation. We look at the local newspaper every week. We give them opportunities in school. And these are not only for their careers, but also while finding a job while they are studying with us. And also there's significant uh, volunteer opportunities in the city. And what employers are looking for more especially now is to see the range of skills that students bring to the job. So it's not sufficient anymore for a student or a prospective employee to be good at uh, research or to be good at communication or whatever, employers want to see that they have worked and they have volunteered and that they have a great sense of community. If you want to look at some useful websites for difficult to fill vacancies and to see where the research is coming from, Solace is the biggest organization looking at vacancies within Ireland. And then you have the ERSI, which is the uh, organization tasked by government to look at um, research and what industry needs. And also Skills Ireland uh, produces publications in logistics and supply chain skills group. Also, Indeed, Irish Jobs, LinkedIn, Globalization Partners, etc. So there's lots of opportunities for students who come. So I think the key messages for your um, audience is that Ireland wants students and international students. 
and most especially, Ireland needs international students as future employees. So choose Ireland. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Celestine. It was really wonderful uh, uh, presentation from your side, especially on slide number 18. You mentioned about certain concerns which, uh, which Irish government and universities might have taken care of and now and going, going forward. I've got quite a few questions coming up, uh, but I think I'll mention just two of them because you pre-answered uh, most of these in your, in your presentation. So that was so wonderful of you. One of them is, uh, are there any sectors that came into pressure as the first question and uh, the students could avoid, at least in the near future? Um, I think the sector that came most into pressure in the um, COVID era was actually the hospitality sector. Hospitality. And that sector has not recovered, but at the same time, it's not fully recovered because Ireland is a very open economy. Tourism is a huge, huge industry, but still you find now there are huge numbers of jobs available in a part-time capacity for international students who come to Ireland to study. For students who want to do hospitality as a career, there are wonderful institutions where they can study. And also there is such a demand for hotel managers, for chefs, there is huge demand for um, people to work in this sector. While the whole economy has not recovered in hospitality yet, we imagine that in 2023, this will be a boom, um, what would I say, a boom time for hospitality. Everyone in Europe wants to travel. Everyone in the US wants to travel. People cannot wait to leave home. We are all tired of it. We have had it during COVID. And I think for international students, working part-time in hospitality is a great, great, great way to learn how to work in Ireland and to prepare them for the demands of a full-time career here. Perfectly understood. One last question uh, is regarding the differentiation that the students keep in mind uh, between uh, the UK and the Ireland. Would you like to mention something for, uh, not from a student's point of view, but from, or whatever, a student's point of view or the business perspective, you would like to address to differentiate between these two and how this will cope up uh, going ahead because they consider both of them on the same page, more or less, you know, and still, yeah. a place, and still place UK slightly uh, a step ahead of uh, Ireland. So you have, would you like to summarize this quickly? Yes, and I think that this is, you know, in Ireland and in Irish education, we have been battling this concept. The UK has wonderful colleges, wonderful universities, but the issue really is now for students, they will not be able to travel freely in Europe as they had been before. They come to Ireland and they study in Ireland. They will be able to travel freely into the UK. They will be able to travel freely into Europe because Ireland has still a very special relationship with the UK because we share a border with the UK in the north of Ireland. Also, I think that the, the issue, while we have a large number of international students coming to Ireland, it is tiny in comparison to what is coming to the UK. So I think this gives international students a slight edge if they come to Ireland, because in the end, there are so many international Indian students, Pakistani students, Sri Lankan students competing for jobs in the UK. People, uh, the economy, nobody knows what the economy in the UK is going to do. The one thing that is sure, it is not progressing. It is not increasing at this time. Brexit is having a huge effect on the British economy. COVID has paused the, uh, what would I say, the effects of that um, choice by the British public, which we have to respect their choice. But we think in Ireland that the effects of Brexit on the British economy will be effect, it will not be fully uh, in place until for the next four or five years. And we feel that this economy, while Britain wants to be, it's a huge economy, they want to be in charge of it themselves. They have cut themselves off from the biggest market, the
that is right across the water from them, which is all of Europe. And that really for us is, um, we're a very small country. Maybe we have a different sense of humor. We don't take ourselves too seriously, but really and truly, we think that that was a very silly decision. And we hope that they will look at it in the future because we share so much in common with the UK as you know, we were a colony. I think like a lot of the Indian subcontinent, you share this experience as well as us. We now say in Ireland that the Brits came to visit Ireland as tenants and they never paid any rent. So they owe us a lot of money maybe in back rent. But I think a cautionary tale for your students is when they come, there are a shortage of things in Ireland at the moment and be careful with accommodation. Make sure they have accommodation before they come and source it before they come. And that will, that will be a little bit of a problem in 2022 and 2023, but after that, I think it will not. Wonderful piece of advice you've given, you were able to give to our business stakeholders as well as to the students this time. Thank you so much, Celestine. It was a good uh, you know, presentation from your side. And we look forward to seeing you, meeting you again uh, sometime later. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Mr. Kumar. I'm sure, I'm sure everybody who attends this uh, summit and looks at Ireland presentation would definitely look uh, uh, at uh, Galway Business School and Ireland as one of the you know, preferred destinations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. And please share my details with anybody. But I think um, I appreciate this. TASA Global have done a wonderful job with these summits. It's a brilliant idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you very much indeed. Well, audience, uh, you heard what Celestine had to say about Ireland as a territory. And I now introduce the next gentleman on uh, our side. He's Mr. Gonzalo Martinez from Spain. You see his picture on board. I'm sure he's going to be live on screen to you. He's director for Campus Spain. He's done his own master's in international management in IE Business School. And he's also served like an international business student at the University of Pennsylvania and the US and started Campus Spain as a company to promote Spain as an international destination, study destination for higher education. And almost six years ago, he's been doing that. Uh, so again, without wasting much time, I'm going to bring him online. Uh, I'm going to request him to come online and uh, thereafter he takes over and uh, he shows, or he's going to tell you his vision or his understanding about Spain, about how this, um, how Spain as a territory you know, managed all this. He's going to also tell about how what campus Spain is all about and what should students and the business stakeholders look for from Spain in the near future. All right, uh, good morning to you, Gonzalo. Uh, here is where we are. Thank you to, thank you to receive our um, um, invitation to be here and talking to us and talking to our business uh, stakeholders on this online summit. As you know, the title of the summit is Overseas Education Business Outlook for 2022. And we are in part two of this. Part one was held some time back. And uh, to the audience, and now I want to give the control to Mr. Gonzalo from Spain. He's directly live coming up from there. He's going to speak about how the outlook of 2022 is going to look like, especially for fall 2022 and beyond. Uh, I'm going to leave the control to him, how he wants to carry it forward. In case you feel, audience, that he has partially answered or not answered some of the apprehensions or doubts that you have in mind, feel free to talk to me uh, or give it on the chat box or otherwise. And uh, I will be seeking those answers from Mr. Gonzalo right away for you and giving it to you. Over to you, Gonzalo. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and welcome everyone to this uh, session. I'm Gonzalo, I'm the director of Campus Spain here in, in Spain. And I will uh, explain to you a little bit what we do. And, and during the presentation, I will try to cover uh, those typical questions uh, for you guys to, that are still deciding to, to study abroad. So what we mainly do in Campus Spain is to promote our country as a study destination. 
we um, visit abroad institutions uh, and, and promote our country and the students that join our programs, they can study anything at any university in, in Spain. So as you may know, Spain is- uh, Sorry, one, one, one moment, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Gonzalo, your voice is uh, inappropriate. Can you please speak louder? Yes, absolutely. I can try to be closer to the to the screen as well. To the mic. Yes, to the mic. Yes, right, right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to put off my video and put myself on mute mode, but I'm remain live. Okay, so that. There's okay, no great. No problem. No problem. Okay. So as as you may know, Spain is one of the most developed countries in in the world. We are located in the southwest in, in Europe. Uh, it's a, a very historical country, but the in terms of, of, of security, which is one of the most important things nowadays, is one of the safest countries, not only in Europe, but, but also uh, worldwide. Uh, also, it's important to point out for international students that our uh, healthcare system is one of the most uh, uh, developed in, in the world and uh, is free even for, for international students that are in. in Spain is. is uh, well known for, for the sport. Here you can see some, uh, let's say, important people uh, coming from Spain and also uh, for the cinema industry. This is something that is also very important in, in India. This is why I wanted to, to show it here. Uh, in Spain is located the only hub for Netflix in all Europe. So many productions that you can see in Netflix are actually coming uh, or are being produced in, in Spain. Um, Nowadays, as I start, started by, by saying, Spain is a very modern and very developed country, and it's a country for you to, to enjoy. So think that you are coming to study, but not only study. I mean, you will be living here and you need also uh, things to do, right? So uh, later on, I will explain uh, some benefits of, of a, a Spain as a member of EU uh, countries. Uh, but here you can, you can see some uh, interesting things. For example, in, in there is a, a, in the south, southern part of Spain, there are some mountains that you can ski and at the same time, you can see the ocean, right? So that's a very um, unique point in, in, in Spain. Moving forward, I want to show you uh, some very important brands in Spain. And, and I, like to, I like this slide precisely because this might be one of the of your future employees or, or let's say your future employers, sorry. Um, I mean, those brands, most of them you already know, uh, but are brands in Spain that work internationally. So think that you will be a, an international student in Spain uh, and your profile will be perfect for their needs, okay? In terms of, of university, Spain is a very long, the, the, the tradition here is very long standing. I mean, uh, the oldest university in Spain is uh, more than 800 years, uh, but we also have some modern uh, universities. These are the 50 public universities that we have in Spain. Okay, keep in mind this, the, the public universities. And in Spain, we have a 35 private universities, okay? The public universities are funded and funded by the government, okay? That means that uh, the big part of the fees will be covered by the government. So you don't need to pay the fees in full. In case of the private universities, belong to uh, private communities, belong to private entities, and are funded and funded by a public, private institutions. That means that you will have to pay the fees in full. Let's get to this point later on. As I was saying at the beginning, uh, Spain um, belongs to European Union. That means that you will be living in Spain, but also in Europe. Europe belongs to, uh, sorry, Spain belongs to the Schengen area. So when you get a visa to study in Spain, you will be free to move around the Schengen countries, okay? So you will be living in Spain, but the weekend, uh, you can visit different famous cities in different uh, famous European countries, okay? Again, you will get your, your Schengen visa that allows you to visit 27 different countries in, 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 in Europe. That means that you don't need to apply for a different visa every time that you want to, 
to visit France or Poland or Germany or, or wherever. Spain belongs to the European higher education area. And that's very important because uh, when you get your degree or your, your bachelor's or your master's in Spain, that degree will be automatically recognized in the 45, 49 members that belong to the European higher education area. Okay, so that's a powerful and unique uh, selling point, let's let put it this way, because uh, you will be studying in Spain, but your degree will be automatically recognized in any of those countries that you can see here on the, on the screen. One also interesting thing is the Erasmus uh, program. Erasmus is a program, uh, a mobility program. That means that a bachelor degree, for example, in, in Spain is four years, right? So uh, one of these four years, you can study abroad. So you will be an abroad study, uh, an abroad student coming from India to Spain. You will do three years in Spain, but the, the fourth year or maybe the third year, you can move to a different country, to Germany, to Italy, to Ireland, for example. You will still be paying the, the fees um, from Spain, but we will get to the to the fees part in the end of the presentation. Um, but you will receive um, a scholarship from the European Union to cover your cost of living in this new country that you will be staying for, for a year. Okay? Um, when it comes to, to rankings, uh, I don't want to, to spend much time on, on this point because I, I, I don't have many, I don't have long, long time to, to do the presentation. Um, but keep in mind that the Spain, that the universities in Spain are, are located, are situated on the, on the rankings on the top, right? You don't look for the a full university in the rankings, look for the school in this university that you want to, to study. I mean, if you want to study uh, engineering, Look for the school of engineering of certain university, and that you will find like um, let me check like uh, not in this one, but for example here in the Shanghai rankings, you can see that the, in food science and technology, eleventh universities are in the top seven, seventy-five in the world. Okay, as I as I was saying, uh, the, our universities and the, the the schools of those universities uh, are well run. In the, in the main uh, important rankings, okay, like these ones. Okay, one of the most interesting things is that uh, you will be learning a Spanish language. I know that at this point, the students always get a little bit confused because they think that they can study in, in, in English in Spain, but keep in mind that Spain is not an English speaking country. Okay, we speak Spanish in Spain. Why is that important for you? Because, because Spanish is the second most spoken language in the world. Okay, the first one will be English in the, in the business related fields, and the second one is Spanish. And in terms of a native language, the first one would be Chinese, Mandarin, but the second one is Spanish. Okay, it's a language spoken by more than uh, 650 million people. Okay, so this is one of the main assets that you will get out from from studying in Spain, because in the end you will be uh, you will be a, a proficient in your mother tongue. In, I know in India you have different, but you will be also proficient in English and in Spanish. Okay, so that will convert your your profile uh, in, in very interesting for for the companies, right? As I was saying, it's the second most spoken language in the world, official language in 21 different countries. 573 million people are, those are the native speakers. And if you are the, the people uh, studying Spanish as a second la uh, language, that will uh, reach up more than uh, 650 million people, okay? It's the second or third language on the internet, and it's very easy to learn, so don't 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 be afraid. We've been receiving students coming from India uh, from the past uh, five to six years, and all of them learn Spanish in in ten months. I will get to that point later on. Okay. Um, as I was saying, it's uh, very important nowadays. But it's becoming even more important the language. Okay. It's expected that by two thousand and fifty. More than 50% of the uh, population in the US will be speaking Spanish, for example. Okay, so when it comes uh, 
to, to the language of instruction in the in the universities in Spain. Okay, um, few universities or few programs might be taught in, in English. Okay, but those will be mostly in a, in private institutions. When it comes to public institutions, those that teach in Spanish, the government will subsidize your education up to ninety percent. So you will be paying around 600 euros per year only for your bachelor degree, for example, okay? How does it work? So you can see a map of Spain here, divided in the regions that we have in Spain. The region is the one that decides how much to subsidize or how much to support the international students. So those regions in green uh, support the maximum they can international students, okay? That makes that you will be paying between 600 and 1,500 euros per year, not per semester, not per month, only per year, okay? And regions like, like Madrid or Barcelona, where they receive a lot of international students already, so the subsidy, the support is less. How to access the Spanish university? So mainly you will not, you will not need admission test. Only for those really demanding bachelors like medicine or dentistry, you will do to, you will need to do some some test, okay? But mainly you will not need to do this admission test. You only need your Spanish language certificate. You will need your your uh, to, if you want to apply for bachelor, you will, you will need uh, the transcripts and the diploma for your high school from your high school. And if you want to apply for master, you will need the bachelor degree diploma and the transcript from your for, from your your bachelor, okay? How do you learn Spanish and how, how do you enroll at Spanish University? So we have a proposal for you, a program called Spanish Language, Culture and Adaptation, which is one year in the University of Vigo, which is the university where we are located here in the Northwest of the, of the country, I'll show you later. Okay, with this uh, program, we will teach Spanish, but more, most importantly, we help you to apply and get the admission to any university in Spain, not only the University of Vigo, all universities I showed you before, you can apply to all them and we will do that for you, okay? And the same for the master degree, okay? So the Spanish, the, the LCA is the Spanish language, culture and adaptation to the university program. It's not only a program to, to uh, learn Spanish, it's also a program that helps you to understand the Spanish culture in a, in a funny way because it's not only classes in the classroom, you also have many cultural activities outside the classroom. And as I already said, the most important part is that we will help you to apply and get admission to the university, any university in Spain, okay? The program is conducted in the University of Vigo, okay, in the language center of the University of Vigo, which is one of the uh, public universities that we've got in Spain, okay? This is uh, uh, some cultural activities that we uh, prepare for uh, uh, students in previous years. Um, Vigo, okay, this is Spain again. This is Portugal here in the uh, east of the uh, Iberian Peninsula. Vigo is located here, okay? Vigo is a very nice city, it's a medium-sized city, very welcoming for international students, and it's a, uh, the safest city in Spain, okay? We decided to do this in Vigo, not in Madrid or Barcelona, because uh, in Vigo, no one speaks English, mainly. Uh, so you will be forced to study Spanish from the very beginning. And that's how we make that in only 10 months, you reach from zero up to B2 level, which is more than enough to apply and get admission in any university in Spain, okay? Regarding the things that you need to do to apply and, and get admission first to our program and then to any university in Spain, don't worry. We will handle all these things for you, okay? So this is how we make it very easy for you and very convenient. From the very from the very beginning, we will apply. We will help you to apply for the visa, uh, to enroll the LCA program, our our program, uh, to prepare your journey to Spain, uh, to find the accommodation, the medical insurance, and so on and so on. These kind of things you don't need to worry about them. Okay, is that expensive? Not really. I mean, the first year is a little bit more expensive because it's a language program. So the government does not subsidize the language program. But the government put it this way. If you learn my language, then I will pay for your education. Okay, so learn the language and then the, the government will pay for the a bachelor or master for you, okay? In terms of cost of living, if you compare Spain to the other popular destinations to study abroad, we win because living in Spain is very cheap if you compare it to other uh, famous countries, okay? 
And our next program, we, we have two, two intakes, the one starting in, in October, and here is when I come to the to reply the, the questions that I, I received from, from you guys. Um, our next intake will start in, in October, and we expect to receive around 50 students coming from India only. Okay, in total, we expect to have 200 uh, students. We expect to be fully recovered from this uh, uh, pandemic situation. Okay, so we expect to, to, to receive around 50 students coming from, from India. Um, there are not many restrictions to come to, to Spain to study here. Okay, uh, you will need only to, to prove the, your, or either that you have a fully a vaccination or I mean the three doses or uh, just by doing a PCR test in 72 hours before you travel, I, I remember. Uh, with that, it's, it's okay. You don't need to do any kind of quarantine uh, and, and our borders have been uh, open for international students during the whole uh, pandemic situation, okay? Um, what else can I tell you regarding this? Uh, the, the classes will be face-to-face. Uh, -face. Even during the, uh, the pandemic situation, uh, classes being face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, only during three to four months during the worst moment of the pandemic, the uh, government decided to move the classes to online, but that was not a very satisfactory uh, experiment. So the classes being back to normal almost one, one and a half year ago. Okay? Um, again, parents and students don't need to worry about uh, anything because we'll be here to help you to go through all these uh, procedures. So keep in mind that uh, our next intake, the 10 months intake, will start next October, okay? How to apply to the program? It's very easy. Uh, you just need to send us the, the application form together with the passport and the academic results. We'll uh, conduct a brief interview uh, after that, we uh, uh, ask the, the university uh, if you are good to, to um, get the admission. Uh, then we will send you the, the offer letter. Reservation payment will be done at, uh, at this point. And then we help you to, to apply and get uh, the visa and prepare your, your travel to, to Spain. Um, don't worry uh, again. Uh, regarding these things, okay? We will, I just have this slide here to, to give you a, a brief introduction about that, but all this, we will be helping you during all the time, okay? I will uh, guide you through all these procedures, what uh, you need to do, where you need to do, and, and so on and so on, okay? The idea of this slide is to let you know that uh, things must be done here. Uh, those things are uh, complex, but we will help you to go through it. Okay, we have a, a expertise on this field. We've been helping students uh, coming from India for the past five to, to six years. Uh, and we have our connections in the, in the embassy to, to help you in case, in case that is, is needed, okay? So that's pretty much all from my side. Uh, just let me give you uh, an interesting thing coming to this, to this part, okay? Um, when you are a student, when you, as long as you have your, your student visa, you can get a part-time job, okay? Uh, during the LCA program, of course, and during the, pro, the bachelor or, or the master. Uh, mainly students are able to get jobs in the tourism companies related because Spain is the second most visited country uh, by tourists uh, in the world. So uh, we have a lot of companies that uh, dedicate their, their jobs to the uh, tourism, tourism sector. Uh, and uh, students, international students, uh, since they speak a very good English, for example, and they are learning Spanish, uh, they are good for this kind of, uh, of jobs. And the students are able to, to get the part-time jobs uh, on those fields. Also, students are able to get jobs like uh, looking after kids or teaching English. Um, and once you finish your bachelor or your master's in Spain, you have one year period to stay here looking for a job, doing nothing, only looking for a job. If in one year you are able to get your job, so you can stay in Spain as long as you maintain this job. If you are not able to get the job in one year, you have to leave the country. Um, 
Also, you can start up your own company here. It's very cheap and very easy to do. And if you have your own company in Spain, you will have also a permanent a resident a resident permit to permanent resident permit to, to stay in Spain. Um, from my part, that's pretty much all. Uh, if you have any question, this is the this is the moment. If you feel like I didn't uh, reply to some of your specific questions, feel free, and I'm here to to give you the answer. Sir, sir, I I cannot hear you. Maybe you you still have your uh, mic off. I mute myself. Sorry, sorry, my fault. All right, thank you so much, Gonzalo. Uh, you were able to answer uh, quite a few apprehensions. No, I sh I should not say apprehensions. I should say clarifications about how Spain looks like uh, for, uh, you know, for students that do not, that are uh, slightly not comfortable with non-English speaking countries. So probably you are able to, you know, throw some light on that. Um, of course, just to let you know, then on the first or second slide, I think it memorized us uh, on my side. I'm sure the same thing will, um, everybody else will also feel about the La Tomatano, Tomatino Festival. Yeah. It was taken, uh, uh, one of the movies, Bollywood movies, were in fact shot uh, <clears throat> shot here in Spain, and you know that came to limelight. Yeah, this one in tourism. Yes, what I see on the um, the festival number, the slide number, sorry, the picture number two, and also on the bull race. Yes, which is just two of them. Uh, you know, got very um, they got into the entertainment industry. Also acknowledged that, but anyways, leaving that part aside. I've got a few questions for you curated from, uh, you know, what the audience wants to know, definitely for the COVID situation that we are presently into. We passed through, and but in some places we are still passing through, you know. I'm sure the situation is there to say. If I ask you, sir, what are the sectors that came into, that you would pre prescribe for the students to take in for Spain? I think your slides were not, uh, you know, highlighting that. So let me ask that question for you. What are the sectors? I mean, engineering, non-engineering, hospitality, or whatever. Would you like to throw yeah, some in, on that, sir? In, in Spanish universities, uh, you can study anything, and we will help you to get enrolled in any program. Okay. As I was as I was trying to say, um, many different universities that we've got here are very good for different uh, uh, sectors. Let's say, for example, the University of Vigo is one of the top universities in Spain. For engineering, okay, but the, but uh, you can study anything. So the way we work with the with the students is that they let us know what they want to study, and we try to guide them the best we can towards one university or other university. Um, in terms of uh, jobs in Spain, um, as you can see here, we have anything. Uh, companies uh, in banking, in tourism, in manufacturing. Actually, Spain is the second uh, largest uh, car manufacturer in, in in Europe. Okay, so I mean, our our companies are uh, all around the world, and those companies are seeking for international students with this uh, mindset of being an international student. Okay, but still, they are from their country of origin, obviously. So this makes the the the, the student the international students become a powerful asset for those uh, companies. So you feel the same trends are going to continue even now, despite the COVID situation. Yes, yes. I think that COVID was just a a, a moment that everyone just wants to forget, and we just want to get back to our normal life. <laughs> you know? Yes, you're absolutely right. Okay. So hopefully, hopefully we are able to, to just forget this as soon as possible. Any suggestions you would like to give to our uh, business stakeholders to, to create a game plan or business plan for Spain? You mentioned some of them to remove the, you know, the Spanish language uh, issue from the mindset as a, it's a mindset. Uh -huh. but, uh, anything else that you would like to guide our business stakeholders for Spain to look at Spain as a territory for their students? I mean, Spain has a very uh, unique selling points that uh, every time that I explain this to a student or to a business partner or, or whatever, they always say the same to me. Oh, this was coming from Spain? I didn't know. 
No? So if we are able to, to, to show and to promote more people, I'm sure that we will be able to, to find more uh, potential students. You know? For example, uh, again, related to, to these companies or related to the, the many, many uh, things that Spain is famous for, but people still don't know that those things are coming from Spain. And actually, in, from my point of view, one of the uh, most powerful assets that we've got in Spain is the language. You know, language uh, is a, a door opener for, for international students. You know, I always say the same. In, in the coming future, Latin America, almost the whole America, is one of the regions that will see uh, biggest or largest growth in their economies. And in all those countries, they only speak Spanish. You know? So this is an opportunity for, for the international students. Otherwise, students, international students will be all, always the same, having the experience abroad and speaking English. You know? So I always say the same to, to the students. Go for a second language, you know, because you already speak English. So this is a new opportunity for you. I agree with you, Gonzalo. In fact, uh, I was personally doing, uh, in my past company, I was, uh, uh, you know, I used to travel to South American or the Latin American territory quite a few times. And I could, I had the opportunity to stay back in Brazil for almost mm -hmm. a year or more, which speaks Portuguese, not Spanish. But uh, with not much of an effort, I could say that I became comfortable in, um, you know, understanding the context of the discussion. For Portuguese, I stayed. Uh, for Brazil, I stayed longer, so I could even participate in the discussions with not much of an effort. I mean, I was okay in, in just about you know forty-five to sixty days of time. So people feel that it's a difficult language, but it is not. I agree with you, especially for Indians who are used to speaking in multiple languages. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's not true. Exactly. Thank you so much, um, uh, Gonzalo. You could, could clarify some of these doubts. I, one one particular question: Are there any sectors that you feel should be avoided? I mean, hospitality is one of them. But if there are any sectors that could be avoided now, would you like to mention? Yeah, uh, the for energy Spain, for sector. Spain. For Spain. Yeah, yeah, en energy sector. Uh, engineering will become most more important in the uh, few coming years. Spain will arise as one of the uh, most uh, important countries uh, for uh, renewable energy. No? Uh, we have companies here that are very strong already, and this new geopolitical situation will change that. And in, in my opinion, uh, the uh, uh, energy industry will be, will be more important in the coming years. So you advise students to opt Spain for these three or four sectors particularly? Right. Yeah, exactly. Business as well is one of the uh, good sectors here, but I guess that this is the same anywhere around. Business meaning the, the MBA or the management program. Yes, right? exactly. Exactly. All right. Thank you. I think that was a wonderful uh, uh, you know, summarization of uh, what Spain should be looked up, looked for. Uh, or thank you. Thank you. For. Thank you so much. We we'll see you sometime later. All Absolutely. Right. In person. Thank you for Robert. inviting me. Yes. Thank you once again for being, Thank you. Thank for being with us for some time. Thank, Thank you. you. Have, a, Goodbye. have a good time. Thank you. Thank you, audience. You heard what Mr. Mar Mr. Martinez said about Spain. And now we proceed to our next person who is on board today, who is on our side today from Singapore. She is Ms. Rani Samiraj. She has over 12 years of experience, as you see, in the international student recruitment. Uh, she promotes, assists, and facilitates the international student recruitment for Singapore, particularly. She's familiar with how uh, you know, Singapore looks like as far as uh, the current situation is concerned. She presently is working for MDIS. She's a country manager for India and Sri Lanka. So just be online, and I'm going to request her to be with us immediately. All right, uh, um, my audience, uh, let me, I've already introduced uh, Ms. Rani Samiraj to you. So here is where she is. You already see her on screen. And she's going to take some time uh, now to explain uh, the overseas education business outlook for 2022, as it looks like for the region, which is uh, Singapore. It's one of the sought after countries, as you know. And let's see what she has to say. Of course, uh, after the presentation gets over with Rani, 
uh, I'm going to give her some time and give you some time too to you know seek certain questions that uh, we are not able to that we are not able to touch base with with her. Over to you, Rani. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv. All right, for uh, the purpose of for the purpose of uh, clarity, I'm going to um, stop my own video so that uh, the audience sees only you and your presentation and nothing else. All right. Noted. Noted. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Hello, all. Uh, let's go to the session. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, you know uh, foresee how to foresee the overseas education business. Uh, for the upcoming year 2022 let's jump into the graduate job market uh, first because that is a main point that we need to uh, you know see uh, let's see what uh, survey uh, says about job market improvements uh, you know after uh, pandemic so uh, this is one of the surveys uh, conducted by ise uh, who I know conducted the survey among uh, the firms in Singapore and UK. So as per the uh, surveys, uh, it says uh, almost half of the uh, firms actually expecting to grow their workforce uh, coming uh, years actually, which is a good sign for um, you know job market improvement. Um, and also they predict. Uh, it's about 15% uh, going to be higher than uh, how it was in 2018. I mean, pre-pandemic time. So, which is a very good sign for the, uh, you know, job market improvement. And obviously, it gives the way for the graduate uh, students to uh, study uh, now. And also, like, uh, they also have indicated that this opportunities will take some time to recover because uh, the firms are just start recovering now and they started going to, you know, they're going to start uh, recruit from now on. So, which takes at least six months to one year time, they predict, and which means, uh, so this is a time for um, graduate student to get into study now because it's one to two years time they can spend now so that when they complete their you know graduation they will be uh, ready to take up the uh, job market changes so uh, let's move on to how the student recruitment is going to be into 2022 this is also based on the survey uh, that is uh, being conducted uh, among the educational agents um there were 775 agents participated in this uh, survey from 19 different countries including india uh, so as per their responses uh, it, it shows like you know majority uh, more than 85 percent of uh, you know uh, agents are actually more optimistic about the um, improvements that are happening uh, about COVID-19 uh, pandemic, because uh, there were incidences where the countries are uh, started ignoring the uh, pandemic situations now, and they came up with the concept like live with COVID-19, like UK and Singapore also started doing that concept. And COVID-19 vaccination also another uh, you know positive point to face the um, pandemic situation. So, and the job market also started getting improving, which means, so the agents actually uh, are very confident that it is going to be a very good year uh, for this international student recruitment compared to 2022, I know, uh, the last two years, I mean. And coming to the uh, student mobility data, if we see that we know, uh, like, you know, we assume like, you know, 2020 was a very bad year, and 2021 uh, was good compared to 2020. But still, if you see the data uh, about the student, how many students have gone out of India, even during the uh, uh, pandemic time in both years from 2020. So uh, India actually sent almost four lakhs uh, students outside uh, for the higher studies, which is quite surprising. Um, and uh, as always, India is being a second largest market for international student recruitment. And uh, even during the pandemic time, it was uh, it, it has been maintained by India. 
and uh, i assume like you know these 4 lakh students actually gone into the uh, countries that were open and uh, you know uh, and uh, less uh, pandemic uh, hitted uh, countries actually so those uh, borders were open so which means uh, our students never stop whatever happens our indian students uh, and you know who are intend to study abroad they keep doing their works actually so uh, this is a, that's how the data speaks and if you uh, see the uh, mobility uh, international student mobility from india if you categorize the countries wise uh, us 32% and if you see top 4 us uk canada and australia if you see this particular data this 4 lakhs before uh, pre pandemic us actually got a, a major market contribution compared to uh, other countries but still even now it was uh, us but still like you know uk actually got uh, some attractions because of the stay back options and you know uh, hassle free uh, visa and uh, entry requirements so uh, so this uh, last year actually it has got a very good uh, percent of uh, students from india so these are the four major uh, you know countries have uh, shared the students uh, during the pandemic time and uh, coming to singapore if you see this data uh, this is actually a uh, common data uh, maybe the percentage will uh, vary year to year uh, if you take uh, even uh, in normal situations this is a top four countries would always share our uh, students for a study uh, purpose Mm, and if you see the singapore and uh, malaysia would take the 1% of the market so uh, the data would uh, remain same maybe the percentage would change um, it is uh, if you see every year 1000 to 1200 uh, students are uh, going to singapore uh, for higher study purpose so this is a actual data and uh, if you take uh, mdis in particular um, every year we are getting uh, 100 to 110 uh, students uh, from india market so which is our uh, market contribution um, coming to the uh, you know uh, employment trends that is happening in singapore um, there is a uh, there is a definitely a skill set uh, requirement pre pandemic and post pandemic obviously so after the uh, you know during and post pandemic time uh, the singapore has uh, singapore government has taken many uh, steps to focus more on health uh, that they had before on smart city project uh, right now they channelize all the uh, you know uh, projects and um, investments into health now so this uh, already moh ministry of health started you know expanding their polyclinics and they have the plan to um, you know make the infrastructure for primary care uh, by within 2030 and they also uh, they started doing this new, uh, 12 new polyclinics they already you know started doing it and additional uh, they need they are in the requirement of additional 30000 health healthcare workers and already like you know they have started working on it you might have seen all uh, the opening for nurses opening for you know healthcare workers uh, already uh, you know everywhere so that is a, this is a top one uh, skill requirement right now in singapore and the second top uh, two i mean second uh, top two you know uh, requirement for um, uh, skill set is uh, cyber security and as per data it is uh, asia actually like requirement of they have the gap of 2.14 million of uh, you know uh, need for cyber security professionals so as you know singapore is uh, it is it is a very safe first country not only to live but also for the data and uh, singapore always like you know it it, it it it's it's a, it is always overfilled with the data every day Uh, even you know uh, the developed other developed countries like us uk they have their uh, data being protected from uh, singapore 
so singapore is and also it's a place for manufacturing and business things and finance so they have huge data coming in every day and they need people to manage it and secure it and save it so this is a uh, second uh, top most uh, skill requirement in singapore and the other uh, top skills that are uh, you know required now uh, are listed here and to sum up basically the business skills management uh, it mm, and robotics because once the this pandemic held uh, you know is being improved obviously the singapore would go back to its project called smart city nation so they will be like you know return back any time and they already started were uh, they they have been doing the robotics because they the government already planned to bring in robots into the uh, service part so that uh, they already started this project which is going on now but with a less attention right now but once the situation improves obviously like you know they are going to come back with the same projects and they are in the need of uh, ai and robotics uh, skill set people so definitely it's a good opportunity uh for the students who are you know with the skill set of this category can definitely look for singapore now and if you see the nominal uh, gross domestic product shared by uh, industries in uh, singapore for the 2021 as always uh, more than 20% revenue was generated by the manufacturing uh, industries sectors so manufacturing basically like you know um, as you know singapore is hub for everything you know not only manufacturing it is a hub for education finance uh, you know it is a for data maintenance so for everything it is a hub it is used as a hub so manufacturing what they do manufacture basically like you know um, electrical parts electronics uh, automobile parts and you know hardwares um apparels cosmetics so whatever food and food materials uh, so whatever that you think you know most of the products are uh, being manufactured in singapore from the asian side so which contributes the major singapore's economy uh, so the second top most uh, uh, sector uh, was wholesale obviously when there is a manufacturing there will be a, a wholesale uh, Uh, uh trading would be there so which generates uh, the second topest to revenue for the singapore's economy and uh, the third one is the finance and insurance obviously when there is so much of things happening uh, the finance and data would be rolling so to maintain that obviously the banks and tradings and you know finance companies are there so which makes the third most topest uh, you know uh, contributor for singapore's economy so uh, the other services includes education services medical and uh, tourism and hospitality so those industries actually like you know have made the uh, fourth topest uh, contribution so it would as per the data it shows like you know if you see the four top uh, contributors of uh, singapore this is the same data is being uh, same data in the sense these are top four categories has been in the system for long time only the percentages will change so which means the singapore is a place for business it is a place for manufacturing it is a place for you know doing your retail services so uh, if any students with a background of uh, business or those who are in a plan to start up a business uh, or in the background of management yes singapore would be the best option uh, to go for and this is also one of the uh, point that we need to see uh, singapore's population because as per data every year it's almost 1% of uh, increase in total populations of singapore uh, and also if you see the local singaporeans uh, median age they are in the 40 to uh, 42 years of uh, age category right now and uh, as per the united nations projections it will you know these people are going to be aged uh, obviously like you know after 65 years there will be a replacement required so they assume like you know obviously they need a healthcare administrators and managers who are right now these 40 to 45 category people are occupying the managerial roles in singapore right now so 
so in 10 years time obviously those places will be open up so uh, these are the additionally with the covid 19 the pop, uh, population concern also added for singapore so definitely they are going to be in the need of manpower soon so this is a time for the student to you know uh, get into the basic education basic uh, you know local uh, standard education to make their profile completely different and uh, develop the skills that is required by the uh, singapore's uh, you know companies and coming to the uh, students concerns like if you see saying if you if if we take the indians uh, students and parents Singapore is definitely not the first uh, option for them to, you know, go. Uh, we really need to accept the fact Singapore is actually somewhere between fifth or sixth option for the students, and we need to accept that fact, and uh, we need to work on work based on the fact. So right now, uh, right, I'll talk about that. Basically, right now the situation for Singapore is the border is completely open, like UK. and uh, uh, so the students or like you know the people who are vaccinated or even non vaccinated people can come into singapore with the guidelines that is being uh, described for them and uh, as per as now concern the learnings are going uh, virtual though the student can go there right now the classes are going online and for the temporary reason because the cases are uh, countable there right now and soon it will change to face to face and sometimes uh, if you take two months three months back there was a hybrid model like you know the stu student had uh, option to come to campus for the study as well as they have option for the online also and so it is completely mixed of everything because of the, this unprecedented uh, time you know pandemic situation we really not able to uh, you know conform on the mode of uh, learning anytime anything may happen and um, this is definitely a concern for uh, students indian students especially uh, because um, basically like you know the student and parents would invest uh, money on uh, you know other country as mainly to go there and uh, explore the country and explore the options there uh, Uh, we do we do recognize that we do you know respect that and but because of the situation right now the virtual learning is being uh, part of it and uh, we can tell them that uh, it is a very temporary uh, you know uh, solution so which is like you know any time the situation becomes very normal the face to face will uh, come come back so we can convince the student because they can't wait for the um, situation to come normal because which we never know when it would come actually so we can definitely like you know uh, emphasize that this particular they can go because the main uh, point here is the student can very well travel to singapore uh, so which is the main requirement for uh, student and parents i guess so that is no problem so only the virtual learning you can definitely we can say that it's a very temporary and any time they can go for the face to face class and a uh, uh, part time job is another big concern for uh, students who are like you know um, looking to study in uh, abroad in general but uh, in singapore obviously like as for immigration the international students are not allowed to work part time and there is no stay back option also which is a biggest concern for singapore but uh, but uh, but what i would uh, suggest we need to uh, really need to um, accept that uh, and uh, we need to focus those type of market like you know the student with uh student who are in the requirement of part time job opportunities are who are in, who are in the requirement of or who are very particular with the stay back options i would definitely not consider uh, that student for singapore because singapore is is actually a different market uh, that it, it is it needed a different market and that market is very well present in india uh, you can trust me uh so uh, because because it is very hard to convince a student uh, like who has very stubborn who are the requirement of part time and who are very stubborn with the stay back option 
so those type of you know uh, students we don't have to invest much time on it for that time we can you know invest on the very really uh, okay. workable student uh so uh, and also like you know uh, you can you can also emphasize the requirement of part time jobs and uh, stay back options uh, that is needed in singapore uh, instead like you know sometimes the student would have some limitations where they can go only to the uh, singapore for some reasons but they have the uh, plans of uh, you know they they are very they intend to have a um, stay back options and part time opportunities so those type of students you can you can you know uh, emphasize the requirement of uh, part time job and the requirement of stay back i would say like you know the tuition fees actually comparatively less to the other countries and i do agree the living expenses are quite costly in singapore so but it could be uh, compensated by you know uh, with uh, taking uh student accommodation uh in the campus itself or uh, they can go for the sharing type of uh, living where they can you know uh, minimize the living expenses so uh as far as um, you know my experience with singapore concern part time job is definitely not a necessary option uh, for to you know survive in singapore and uh, stay back options it is not required for singapore because singapore is already a small country it is not like other uh, developed countries where they have 50 states 60 states or provinces together so singapore is a very small uh, country uh, may, uh, but at the same time it has a full opportunities as other developed countries so it is full of companies it is full of job opportunities so so stop stay back option would definitely definitely not a requirement here because the student will be staying minimum one year because the masters degree uh, are one year time so within a one year time definitely the student could explore singapore very well and the company is very well while studying uh, so that is why part time also it is not uh, uh, you know we can't spend time on part time actually so the student can very well spend this time on exploring the uh, job opportunities there so one year actually it's a quite long time for the student to um, you know find a job there the only thing is the the trick point here the student should well aware about the skill set uh, requirements from the companies very well because they before even before going to singapore they need to aware the companies there and what are the skill set that are required whether they have it or what are the improvements they they need to do to meet the requirements so all those research that they have to be you know uh, completed before going to singapore if they do with this uh, research and if they once they land in singapore and they Uh, started doing uh, the simultaneously the exploration part definitely they can end up in a job in a year time so trust me so there is a stay back option is not necessary actually so that is a thing and uh, coming to that again uh, business game plan what the best game plan uh, for 2022 from my point of view so for singapore uh, i would always like you know we can analyze the 1% market that is the that contribute from india so if you see the major contribution from uh, uh, delhi assam gujarat west bengal maharashtra tamil nadu and karnataka so we mbis usually getting applications from majorly from these areas so i would uh, recommend to you know focus on these uh, top seven uh, states maybe uh, to focus on generating leads and uh, you know the recruitments would be easy for um, you know to handle and uh, also like what type of programs we are getting almost all so we are getting for o level a level and diploma advanced diploma undergraduate and masters we are getting uh, we are getting students for all the programs for us and um, if you see the background of uh, this one person market mostly teenage students so as you know singapore would attract uh, because of its safety aspects and it is like almost india so there is no much climate challenges or you know uh, other um, uh, other you know uh, issues like addictions and drugs 
So it is completely low crime rated, a very safest country. So obviously the uh, teenage uh, parents, um, they they actually like, you know, very comfort to send their uh, kids to bachelor degree programs. So that is main market that to, you people can concentrate and the diploma, advanced diploma. If you see, um, there are in the world there are very few countries like Singapore and uh, Canada. They uh, Canada, New Zealand, I guess. So these countries actually recognize the diploma category for the work permits. So uh, we do get students for diploma and advanced diploma category for the work permit purpose. So they um, they want to have a short term course and uh, you know they get into any uh, um, jobs uh, you know uh, in Singapore they do come. And we do get students for masters like, you know, business and finance, healthcare and IT, especially. So uh, basically, like, you know, I would recommend uh, uh, these category background, uh, you know, students inquiries, you can definitely um, recommend Singapore. So they choose, uh, you know, Singapore because it's a potential destination for job market. And also like tuition fee, as I mentioned earlier, very less compared to other countries. And it has very minimal entry requirements. And I would say like, you know, uh, during the pandemic 2020 and to 2021, many uh, agents have suffered um, with the enrollment numbers because of this entry requirements, because the test, most of the uh, usual, you know, countries, they like US, uh, UK and Canada, they they had these uh, test requirements for the, you know, GRE, GMAT, SAT and IELTS TOEFL. So those type of entry requirements actually would delay the recruitment process and especially this time. And so if you see Singapore, there's no such entry requirements. If the student already study in English medium, they don't even need IELTS or TOEFL. So that is the best, you know, uh, destination to look for now. And also business startup plan. So the student with background of business and who are planning to start a business, Singapore would be the very perfect country to do that. And also, like I would recommend to focus uh, your strategies to non-immigration intention uh, students. Like you know, uh, they do. We do have like you know, even if from my experience, I say if I get hundred students per year from India, for ninety students actually like for undergrad and these kind of uh, you know work permits people, not with the, like you know immigration purpose. Only ten students who has uh, who would have like you know plans to settle in Singapore. The rest of 90% would always with a different focus. So I would recommend to, you know, uh, focus your marketing strategies uh, or generate the leads, uh, like, you know, based on the student who are not in the non-immigrant intention and India has very well, uh, you know, students for that. And uh, also Singapore is hassle-free student visa process. So there is no, you know, much uh, time or, you know, much documents required for it. And uh, as far as MDIS is concerned, MDIS will file the um, visa. So that is also uh, free work. So coming to the, uh, what we could do for the, uh, continue the business and growth, especially this time, uh, from my experience with MDIS, I, I handle more than 50 agents from India. So I could see, uh, I could see uh, the agents who are with a smaller setup, uh, with a focused, um, you know, um, destination, say, for example, Singapore, and uh, focused to schools, they do bring in more numbers than the agents with like, you know, many branches, many, uh, you know, uh, operations. So uh, that is a real data that I shared with you uh, because always focused to business gives more yields. And especially this time, uh, I, I don't want to, you know, say which is this is right or wrong. This is basically like, you know, uh, at this particular uh, situation right now, what we are facing now, it is better to open up uh, uh, sit back and think what are the countries right now are open and uh, who are with hassle-free process and who are with the less uh, entry requirements 
and at the, at the same time meeting the requirements of the students so those type of destinations you can you know uh, cut into the minimal size and in in uh, if possible you can still you know minimize the school also because if you focus with the schools programs and you do uh, promote them uh, you can like you know uh, sending uh, 100 different uh, st uh, student to 100 different institutions means you are dealing with 100 different problems so uh, it is better to you know focus one school and you can send the same number of student to the same number of same the same school so you, the the less number of work and less number of challenges and uh, with the same uh, benefits so that actually would be the good plan for especially for this time at least until the market you know recovers maybe one or two, until one or two years and um, and also programs wise if you see i already mentioned the skill set requirements if it is healthcare if it is business if it is management if it is it yes you just promote the marketing strategies only for four uh, four uh, you know uh, programs uh, and uh, with the for the singapore so whatever the inquiries that you people are generating yes you can convert easily for them and also focused manpower this is also one of the point that i would like to uh, share uh, i have seen in my experience like you know the counselor who uh, who are assigned with a different uh, destination to work and the uh, counselor assigned with one uh, particular uh, uh, you know country performs very well compared to the counselor who works for all countries so uh, it is it is that strategy definitely will work uh, so if you have a dedicated counselors um, for the you know dedicated uh, destinations the uh, work uh, workforce and you know the returns will be more uh, for even for one particular uh, country so that would be the best suggestion that i could give for the especially for this pandemic time good fine so uh, I, let me talk about NDIS. So this Management Development of, uh, Institute of Singapore is actually, it's a not-for-profit private institution, which is oldest institutions in Singapore. We are uh, right now 66 years old. And we have uh, four campuses in uh, four different uh, countries. And uh, Singapore actually recruits uh, international students. And we have uh, nine university partners who are in uh, association uh, from uk universities and we are getting uh, you know uh, students from 80 different countries including other developed countries as well and we are uh, you know edu trust uh, certified private institution and we have qualified for the other uh, awards also which is there in our website for our quality of education and standards Coming to schools, we have um, we have eight different uh, schools. Uh, we have School of Business and Social Sciences, and Tourism and Hospitality, Engineering and Technology, Health and Nursing, Life Sciences, Fashion and Design, and MDIS College, School of Language and Education. So MDIS College basically offer O level and A level uh, in category. And uh, adding to that, uh, if as the Singapore uh, population is getting age, so the Singapore government already welcoming the end generation to the in the, uh, to Singapore. So they say that the for student who completes O level or A level in Singapore, they can get the PR right away. So which is like actually a shortcut for uh, you know uh, students to enter very early in Singapore and get the PR. So that they can have the family there uh, with them also. So, which is if this particular thing you can you know promote to the uh, students who are with the immigration plan, who come to you very early, or you can promote this particularly to the potential market, uh, like you know about this or MDIS college, and you can you know get the numbers. So, so schools. And this is the usual pathway that uh, we follow for all the programs. This is a sample for uh, tourism and hospitality. So we have this professional diploma, international foundation diploma, which is equivalent to 10th and 11th, uh, sorry, 11th and 12th in India. So from there, they can go to higher diploma, which is the first year of bachelor degree, and they'll go to move on to the top of, which is the second year. 
and third year. So from there, uh, they can go to master's. So all the uh, programs, mostly except engineering and uh, life science programs, all the programs are actually pathway type. Pathway type, it's very flexible because Singapore uh, accepts diploma, higher diploma categories for work permits. So that's why the education is being uh, designed in such a way this, uh, where the student will have the opportunity to you know, go out and come back anytime in between the pathway. So it, it is very flexible. So after the higher diploma, if the student get hired in Singapore, they don't have to you know, continue unless and until if they want to do it or if they want to have a higher uh, skill job or you know, higher salary, yes. So or if they want to change a curriculum, yes, they can move away and then they take the different uh, career path, sorry, you know, study path. So likewise, it is very flexible and fees also, it, it will go by stages. It is not something that they need to pay in bulk. So that is a thing. And if there are any question and, uh, questions, you can definitely ask me here. And Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rani, for giving a very, um, I should say, a wonderful encapsulation of how Singapore as a territory, uh, you know, the agents should look forward to. In fact, uh, the audience, uh, the agent audience, I should say that this presentation was started from the global outlook of how it was, how it is, and how it could be in future. And then she tried to also cover, you know, certain micro level uh, steps that our agents could uh, should be taking, including, you know, having a dedicated desk or something like that. Frankly speaking, it was one of the wonderful uh, conversation, uh, oh, sorry, for a presentation I could hear from you, Rani. I mm -hmm. had a few questions uh, being received from, uh, you know, from some of the audience here, mm -hmm. but I'm uh, sorry saying that, <laughs> you know, I don't have to ask you because you pre-answered them somewhere or yeah. the other. All right. Okay. So thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you some of some other time. Sure. Okay. To the audience, thank please you. stay back uh, before we shift on to the next speaker. Thank you yeah. so much, Rani. Thank you, Mr. Rajiv. It is really a wonderful session and a good initiative. Uh, and uh, looking forward for more to have an update about markets. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye. All right. Bye. Thank you so much, Rani. Oh, wonderfully encapsulated about. Um, about Singapore as a destination. Well, having said that, now we proceed to the next and the last person today on, um, on our site, on the summit. He comes from Australia. He's an advisor to ECA. He's an international country and an education expert for Australia. He's based out of Australia, as you see him. Um, he's pictured on the left-hand side, Dr. Bushran Singh. He's based out of Australia, and he's held important positions like director of projects, partnerships, he's been marketing, Principal Advisor in Higher Education Institution in Australia, India, and Nepal. He's taught at the University of Wollongong, Central Queensland University, and Australian Catholic University. So once again, I am not going to, I've already introduced you, him to you, and I'm going to request him to please come online. Uh, in a while, he's, he'll be there, and we'll hear from him shortly about Australia. Just be with me. All right, uh, hi audience. Uh, I, I, I hope uh, you're able to see Dr. Gujaran Singh. He, he's uh, live from Australia. He's going to tell us uh, uh, about the insights about Australia, how Australia behaved and how Australia would go ahead in the year 2022 and beyond. So without wasting any more time, I'm going to give the control to Dr. Singh. Dr. Singh, over to you. Thank you very much um, and hello everyone. Uh, as you know, my name is Gurcharan Singh and I'm very pleased to talk about a very vibrant, very safe, very beautiful country called Australia. So um, let's talk about um, some uh, statistics. Dr. Gurcharan Singh, uh, uh, just uh, one moment. Uh, I would like to switch off my video and audio so that only you and the audience are together. All right. Perfect. Okay, two minutes. No worries. All right, so uh, I was talking about um, some statistics here. Um, uh, as you all know, Australia is one of the most popular countries for higher education. And I would like to give you some stats uh, pre-COVID and during COVID. 
So as you can see, in um, 2020, there were about 686,000 international students enrolled in higher education all across Australia. And um, as we all know, because of the very high standard of education here in Australia, multi multicultural environment and beautiful outdoors. Um, 2019 alone, the Australian education export value was about 37.6 billion Australian dollars, which is a huge number uh, and a very established industry. When we talk of our specific countries, so I've taken an example of India here. So uh, when we take example of India, that how many students from India went to, to any country to study. So out of that number, about 20% students came to Australia to study. So you can see the number about 73,000 students uh, coming to Australia out of 375 uh, total students. And that figure was in 2018. And of course, it grew after that as well. Then uh, COVID struck and we know, we all know what happened to the world and Australia was not an exception. In fact, Australia actually uh, suffered uh, and, and paid a very, very heavy price for COVID. Um, there are again some numbers uh, of the decline. As you can see, uh, the visa holders actually fell, uh, Australian visa holders actually fell about uh, by 205,854. Um, That's the figure 200,000 uh, students were you know, uh, less in terms of visa or coming to Australia, and which is about minus 33% of the total sector. Uh, in terms of the value, um, you can see export income uh, almost half to about 22.5 uh, Australian uh, dollars, billion Australian dollars in two years time, which was about 37, 38 billion dollars. Um, one of uh, a very important reason for uh, this very, very uh, severe uh, figures actually is because the Australian government actually uh, implemented uh, one of the world's most strictest border control. And when we talk about the control and the border control, uh, we also must look at the brighter side in this that, um, you know, how responsible the government was uh, to actually safeguard uh, Australian citizens and not only citizens, everyone who was living in Australia at that time. And no wonder uh, why Australia has got uh, some of the world's best, you know, uh, COVID responses and we were the least, uh, uh, you know, impacted and affected by uh, COVID-19 uh, as such. Now, um, since we know that, you know, the um, uh, student arrival plan is now in place, and the government is very proactive. And um, since 15 December, 2021, fully vaccinated students were allowed to travel to Australia. And since November 21, until now, about 56,000 students have already come back to Australia. That's a great news. And now since the borders are open, uh, universities are hoping that about 131,000 students, you know, international students who are waiting and were stuck overseas, uh, will be coming back to Australia and give a, give a boost to, to tertiary education here in Australia. Besides that, the government, the Australian government has done remarkably well by having these uh, great um, you know, government policies putting in place. For example, um, uh, student visa fee is exempted for some time. So students who are applying for visa uh, do not have to pay any visa fee. Uh, temporarily removal of limits on working hours. So as we all know that you know, there is a 20 hour per week uh, uh, you know, working limit uh, in most of the developed world where students go. Currently, that limit has been exempted. So students, in a way, can work full time and earn very good uh, amount of money here in Australia. Besides that, stay and work, for example, post, um, you know, education uh, stay permits are extended. So that gives a longer period, of, you know, to students to stay back in the country and get all important exposure and also to work full time. Uh, which is a great news. Um, talking about employment trends, um, uh, there are some very uh, you know hearty figures there. For example, um, Australia's unemployment rate has dropped to the lowest point in more than 13 years. So that is a rather good news that coming from COVID and such destruction all over, and you know despite that, Australia's unemployment rate is the lowest in 13 years. You can see some figures here. 64,800 jobs created in December 21 alone. Um, and uh, as I said, this is the lowest unemployment rate since August 2008. So great going Australia. 
Um, some examples of the industries uh, in terms of number and employment uh, in Australia. So this is latest 2022 figure that how many people are working in, in which sector. So you can see health services in Australia is pretty strong, uh, uh, not only for the current job openings, but for the futures as well. So you can see 872,000 people working there. Um, then professional services, which includes the, the, the managers, the engineers, uh, again, having about 839,000 people, community services and state government administration, which runs the, the, the government and the departments, uh, of course, is 1.6 million people. Um, again, I picked up one specific example of uh, a country, which is India. And when Indian students are trying to come to Australia, when they come to Australia, and what sort of uh, opportunities do they get for employment? So this is a past data, 2013 to 2018. Uh, so about 78%, which is a good figure, a uh, very good figure rather, employment rate for Indian graduates looking for work in Australia. And 80% that increases uh, when they go back to India with the Australian qualifications and they look for job, 80% of them get gainful employment back home. Um, this is a forecast of 2020 to 2025, that which are the sectors which are going to grow and what rate. So as you can see some, um, very good uh, percentages there. You can see the accommodation, hotels, and food and uh, food services. Um, um, you know, um, tip to be growing at about 16.8, which is about 17%. Um, very good uh, growth rate. And then there is healthcare uh, has always been there in Australia, 14.20. Professional, scientific, and technical, which includes again the engineers and the managers, MBAs and business administration people, 11%. And um, the good old education and training, which is again close to 11%. So there are quite a few sectors which are clocking a double digit growth here. So when students are trying to come from there, they must have a look at the, the sunrise sectors here so that they can choose a specific course. Um, concerns of students, we all know how uh, harrowing time we have all faced uh, students and the institutions. Uh, uh, so what were the main questions and uh, what has been done? So since now borders are open for students, um, first and foremost is the government policies, the government approach that how are they reaching out to students and what special things are being done. Uh, I've, I've talked about this before. I'll talk again. A, a great example of this is unlimited working hours for students here in Australia. And this is currently uh, offered to students so when they come on student visa here. There is no limit. You can work full time. I would reiterate that, you know, um, a good mix of work and study is important uh, because you are, after all, a student here. But still, if there is no limit, students can still try um, as much as possible to work because, uh, you know, they have gone through a lot of uh, financial turmoil. So it's a great opportunity for students not only to earn money, but also to get all important uh, work experience um, and exposure in a, in a developed world. Uh, online classes, we've all heard about this new phenomena. It has been very innovative and very successful. Um, so students have been getting classes in home countries and uh, then, you know, when things improve or borders open, they come to Australia uh, for completion of their education. Um, um, at ECA, Education Centre of Australia, uh, where I'm currently an advisor, uh, they have made, uh, you know, very taken very good steps in establishing a different division called EOL, which is Education Online Learning. And they've established, um, you know, um, a lot of online best in class learning opportunities in countries like Australia, UK, India and other parts of the world. Um, we talk of concerns and we don't, don't talk of financial crunch, you know, um, uh, that will not be a good thing. So I would like to again... Um, stress on this very important point that many universities here are actually offering great scholarships. This is the time to, to take advantage of that. I've already talked about, uh, you know, exemption of limits to work. So you're working full time and earning good amount of money. And also at the same time, you're getting these, you know, fantastic offers of scholarship from universities. For example, um, ECA, uh, Education Center of Australia is introducing about $5 million uh, COVID-19 student relief fund, you know, giving a benefit directly to students. Then um, I have an example of Victoria University offering uh, VU Future Leader Scholarship for international students uh, with up to 20% off tuition fee all across the programs. 
Uh, similarly, the uh, Swinburne University of Technology is offering postgraduate scholarship where they are offering up to 30% of tuition fee on the select program. So as I said, this is the time to take a decision, uh, come to Australia, take advantage of not only fantastic scholarships, but also many other very conducive government policies uh, and take maximum advantage. Um, now, what to do about, uh, you know, the future decisions um, uh, starting now, uh, which will be impacting the education and uh, growth of the business, um, you know, continuity. So there are, there have been, I mean, we have all seen start and home and finish on campus phenomena, uh, very, very important. So many universities have been giving this, uh, you know, that you take some units at home and then uh, once the situation improves, come to, to, uh, to Australia and to the university campus. Um, there is the, there's a pro, we all know the program called Pathways Program, uh, which is a fantastic partnership. And I really believe in this kind of a program. Um, and uh, we at Education Center of Australia has taken strong steps uh, and established, uh, you know, uh, ECA's presence in India, tying up with local institutions there and then working towards, uh, uh, you know, students um, entry to Australian universities. Uh, we've already talked about online delivery and um, we all know uh, how, how, how wonderfully well it has worked and made life uh, very easy for students. And, and these are some areas which are there, uh, which are going to stay in the near future and in the long run as well. Um, suggested business game plan um, for the near future. Um, as I already talked about Pathways program, I, I, I do believe in this program, um, you know, of course, credible, credibility and credible partners is a very important choice to make, but how does it help? I mean, it really helps students to, and it allows them, uh, you know, a considerable fee saving because they are doing one or two years there in their own countries. And uh, after that, they come to uh, the campus here in, in Australia and save a lot of money. Uh, it also actually, you know, brings them uh, a lot of time, gives them a lot of time for adequate uh, preparation for students. So, I mean, it, it doesn't just uh, pick them from one place and, you know, you plant them to the other place. You also students require a lot of preparation because international teaching is very different. So if it all happens, it will be a very good idea, uh, not only for students, even for uh, the universities or the colleges who are tying up because it will be a very consistent and enhanced flow of students from uh, partner A to partner B. Uh, one important thing I would like to mention here is that, uh, you know, because legislation sometimes comes in the way of these kind of partnerships, but luckily, again, I picked up India and Australia. Uh, India has already recognized Australian pathways degree with credit uh, program. So uh, that means that, you know, when institutions, uh, they get together for a program and uh, students start in India for a particular program and then they come to Australia, complete the degree there that degree will be recognized when they go back to India by the government of India. So this kind of agreement is all uh, already in place. So this could be a very, very important, uh, you know, business opportunity for institutions to tie up. Um, some other things to look at is that when you partner with institutions, uh, uh, you know, you must have a look for something special, something out of the box, something unique. So uh, we call it innovative education model. So one such model uh, example is from Victoria University's uh, block model. Now this block model is where students study one unit or one subject at a time over a four week period. So that means one month and one subject only, that is it. So what that does is that each semester, uh, four blocks of four weeks are there. So in one semester, you're studying four, sub four subjects but one subject in one month only. So what that does is that students will have a great opportunity to focus on one subject. So they are giving their 100% to that subject rather than juggling a number of units at the same time. Uh, and since they are international students, they are working as well. And then you're having three or four subjects in a, in a semester. Sometimes, you know, it gets too much for them and impacting their performances as well. So that way block model uh, was introduced in uh, 2000. 2018, still a new concept, but uh, already it has seen uh, great success, uh, not in terms of uh, only the numbers of enrollment, but retention of the students, um, getting very good marks and overall, uh, you know, tremendous improvement in the pass rates of students. So these kind of innovative, um, you know, uh, areas need to be looked at 
in terms of any partnerships or business uh, uh, steps for the future. Um, as I already discussed about the, the conducive government policy, that also needs to be taken care of, looked at, understood properly, uh, because that will also make way for a lot of uh, business opportunity uh, to all the stakeholders. For example, visa fee exempt. I mean, that's a great news. Post-study visa extension. So if students are coming to Australia for a master's degree of two years, um, you might get three more years post your qualification. So in totality, you're staying five years in Australia. And that's a great time for anyone to get exposure, uh, you know, very vital experiences and uh, who knows, a possible job or a permanent resident visa. So these are certain things which, which need to be looked at. Um, and then uh, last but not the least, uh, we must all know how to align the, the skill shortage uh, you know, there are sectors, as I talked about earlier, uh, and, and we all know Australia is an immigrant country. You know, we need uh, quite a lot of hundreds of thousands of people every year uh, to which we give permanent resident visa. So if we know that what areas are going to grow in terms of the opportunity or the, the, the job or the skill shortages, then we need to do the balancing act and, and choose the right courses guide the students to pick up certain areas where they are certain to get you know uh, more opportunities so as i mentioned before healthcare food services professional scientific which includes engineering uh, business administration etc education and training uh, all these areas uh, are are a very very important area in terms of growth forecast for the next 5 to 10 years so these areas need to be looked at uh, to make the most of uh, the planning for the near future. Um, last but not least, I will very quickly go through uh, the organization I belong to. As I uh, talked about, I'm advisor to this um, this organization based in Australia. This is called Education Center of Australia and ECA represents um, some very good universities here and not only represents, but we manage their campuses uh, in, in, in Sydney, in Australia. And um, some of the universities you can see here are Victoria University, Swinburne University of Technology, University of Canberra. So we manage all these uh, campuses uh, in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, and these are all public universities. And uh, besides uh, offering these university campuses and courses, we are also into um, you know, vocational education, uh, professional, um, being ECA professional, which actually takes care of internships. So we actually offer about a thousand, uh, you know, uh, internships every year to stu students coming to ECA group. And then uh, ECA online, which I talked about, is, is a very successful, um, you know, wing of ECA. Um, some of our, uh, you know, achievements in brief that um, we get about 7,000 plus uh, new students every year from 40 different nationalities of the world. Uh, I mentioned about my our internship programs, which are very, very popular, 1,000 plus internship per year in Australia from all over the world. Uh, strong network of 1,200 education agents spread across the globe. Um, and that's where we get, um, you know, recruitment uh, for our uh, institution. Global presence, uh, seven different regions. Uh, you can see Australia, Brazil, China, Europe, India, Philippines and Nepal. And um, AC has actually helped, um, as I talked about, uh, 40 different nationalities, students coming uh, from all over the world, uh, right from the English language courses up to the postgraduate degrees and uh, targeted internships. So uh, we are very proud to have, uh, you know, uh, this legacy and uh, uh, giving it all to our students and helping them in whatever way we can. Um, that's it. Thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, that's what uh, is my name and um, my email. If you have any questions, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. I think it is very well encapsulated uh, about all the possible questions that, uh, you know, the business stakeholders or the students could might have. Um, you know, you kind of uh, covered up all the points uh, that are coming up from the, uh, you know, on the chat box or otherwise. But uh, there is one point which I would like to, you know, take back with you, although you touched upon this uh, uh, topic, Australia uh, made, uh, you know, the students wait for the longest dura duration of the time, you know, in comparison to the rest of the developed world, and it put in the border restrictions for until very recently, you know, something like October, November, when it opened up. So people are some kind of, you know, students are some somehow apprehensive, I should say, 
of should a similar situation arise, what should they do? So if you have any, you know, on the ground news or in the ground feelings of this, would you like to share it with us? Uh, I completely agree with you. Um, it was one of the longest and the strictest uh, lockdown, but I also mentioned that we must see the brighter side that, you know, it shows that how concerned the government is because uh, you know, eventually you look at the results. We were least affected. I'm so proud to say we were the least affected. And that's not only for citizens, that's for our students as well. So it, it, it you know, you look at the larger picture that how concerned the government is. We were having about 38 billion Australian dollar, you know, uh, our export, you know, of, of this industry. And it almost came to half, but still we did not mind. We, we kept the borders closed. Coming specifically to your question is that now, since we've waited too long, hopefully things, you know, have now turned for better. We will not see any more COVID. And the government, uh, as I showed in the presentation as well, uh, it's very, very conducive. They are trying to give students, you know, the best possible offers what we can. And um, hopefully this will continue. In fact, there are many more things in the wings which will be coming towards students. And uh, students should definitely choose Australia. This is the time to take a plunge because if you are permitted to work full time, and I would also like to add here that Australia has got one of the, one of the highest uh, wage rates in the world. Our students earn about $24, $25 an hour. And if you're working full time, eight hours a week, of course, I mean, you need to balance again. I would reiterate students should not come and start working here, but if they are studying and working as much as possible, they are earning a fantastic salary. And they are, I mean, whatever loans they have, they can repay those loans very, very quickly, right? The other important thing I talked about was staying post-study. So two years of master's, they can get three years easily. Five years is a long time to stay in a developed world. Imagine what will happen uh, once, you know, a student gets a degree, stays five years, he or she will be a complete personality, different personality. So just do not worry now. I can assure you Australia is open and welcoming. And if you come here, you'll definitely feel that you've taken a very good decision. Thank you. I think that was a big clarification moment uh, coming up. Yes, I agree that uh, with such a, uh, such a big um, set of relaxations or, uh, you know, those pointers, even support coming from the government system about uh, visa fee waivers, or um, the, you know, the number of hours that one can put in during a week from a student point of view, if those have been relaxed, I'm sure the students are going to, you know, like this country, despite all the past history that uh, they might have gone through. Uh, but one point here connected exactly with this is, sir, um, the students, uh, you mentioned one of the slides, I think if you go back a couple of slides, you will see that these are the sectors that the students should be, should make up. I think four of them you mentioned, education and training, um, it was healthcare, uh, yes, food services, professional, scientific and technical. Yeah. Would there be any sectors that you recommend for students to take up? Um, or the programs to take up at bachelor's or at master's level, as you feel should now be, um, I mean, they are, they are more, uh, the students should uh, be able to, you know, do very well yeah. with or without COVID. Sure, yes. Um, if we look at the history of uh, students coming to Australia, uh, generally uh, students come for uh, IT, engineering and business administration. These are very, very strong areas uh, for Australia, in particular from India. So that has been the, the history. But I would, uh, you know, as the, the chart is there in front of you, healthcare is a very, very important sector here in Australia. And we spend a lot of uh, our, you know, um, our um, GDP uh, amount to, uh, to healthcare um, sector as well. So starting from uh, nursing, uh, is a very important program. Allied uh, healthcare, you know, courses, even short-term courses are in great demand. Uh, hospital management is another program, which is very, very important. Uh, and which actually has got a, you know, it, it, these programs lead to PR, permanent resident visa, which is very, very important for, for our students, especially in South Asia. Students will always try to link their education to permanent visa uh, pathway. So these programs, uh, if diligently planned, uh, for I would like to give you an example here. For example, nursing in Australia, in, in India, 
what people do in some of the agents also if they are not uh, very aware what they do is they get some credits or rpl recognition of prior learning to nursing students they get one or one and a half years off in some australian university and students again start nursing all over again and the nursing fees uh, you know it, it's quite uh, steep uh, plus you need to get seven band each for nursing education so that that becomes very tough what you can do instead is that after your nursing program in india because nursing is nursing and your nursing or our nursing is the same all you need to get get is an equivalence so after your nursing you get admission to a, some program like hospital management right and you get into australia get a two year program you get three years post study stay as well start working start improving your ielts training if you are living in australia for five years i'm sure if you are at a six band you will easily get to seven because that's what australia is you get exposure so not only you have got your indian you know your your nursing degree you got additional masters degree and in the meantime you've improved your english qualifications and only you need to do is to get an equivalence of your indian uh, nursing to australian nursing and get into nursing sector plus if you've got your hospital management uh, you know masters as well you will probably get a you know a, a nursing manager's position rather than just a nurse so these are some some things which you need to go deep into you know people in education they need to understand that how things work in 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 a country and how to get advantage of the government policies what are the requirements here so this is one area i've given you a, a, a you know a, an example and i'm sure there are many in education and training as well be it there are so many i mean hundreds of thousands be it uh, you know uh, degree holders in india you don't need to get another teaching degree in australia so you come here and you join for example a masters in e learning or something get a two year masters again the same route you know and then you improve your english you get seven band each you get a you know a qualification assessed by a teaching uh, state and then you become a teacher here so these are some ways we have to go deep and understand but as you can see all of those four sectors are having double digit growth uh, education training accommodation food services healthcare and uh, professional scientific and technical this includes all those engineers and mbas etc that has always been there i think you've given them uh, given us very quick and uh, you know wonderful ideas for business stakeholders in fact that is what this forum was expected to do and you touched upon those topics wonderfully thank you so much dr singh for coming over on this forum and uh, you know guiding us about how australia will be in the near and far future at least that's the what, what that's what is the outlook for now uh, thank you so much for coming online it is pretty late in the night for you uh, and a special thank you to you know take out a personal time off on a weekend uh, or otherwise and coming over this okay pleasure is mine thank you very thank much thank you so much thank you so much okay bye 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 so hi friends i would like to thank all of you and all four country experts who came today to address you on their countries that was australia ireland singapore and uh, spain so these gentlemen and the lady and two ladies spoke to us about whatever goes whatever is going there in their territories about how students and the countries should look forward to um, sorry the students and the universities are looking forward to welcome these students now in their countries so let me summarize that for you now to begin with let me begin with australia as the first one on my side it was education and healthcare which he insisted the country is looking forward to followed by hospital management besides the routine it engineering and business programs the next comes spain which he insisted uh, it was mr gonzalo he insisted that students could look forward to programs in the in engineering stream which is usual management usual and tourism was something which is like off track which is not drawn normally people to people you know look forward to spain for that kind of program but he said that there are there are there are there are a lot of uh, demand which is picking up on tourism on automobile and renewable energy so students who are looking forward to expertise in this should consider uh, should put spain in their radar 
Next comes Ireland. Of course, it begins with the STEM programs as the number one. Um, you know, shortage of uh, skills for that for that for 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 Ireland as a territory. Followed by construction. Then comes business. Then comes health. And last is transport and logistics. And finally, it is Singapore. So when I say Singapore, it means healthcare, cybersecurity, and data sciences. He insisted that one should look forward to. So having summarized this, this uh, session for you, my dear friends, I would like to conclude this uh, program for today. And I really look forward to you being with us for many more such videos or many more such live sessions that we intend to do in the near and far future. So be with us, keep following us on our, on the, on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. And uh, we really look forward to being with you some next time. Thank you so much. You take good care of yourself. Namaskar.